Okay, good afternoon students. Uh, I am Shankar Kumar. I teach history at uh, Hindu College and it is uh, uh, extremely joyful on my part to uh, joining with uh, uh, to, 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 to join with you uh, for this uh, School of Open Learning classes and uh, what we shall be talking about uh, is uh, the South Indian early historical period, uh, which is uh, part of your syllabus. So we are talking about the uh, the process of uh, social, political, economic changes that characterized South Indian history uh, from the period, say, around seventh to uh, ninth, tenth centuries. Uh, in the common era, and that is the timeline of our discussion today. And uh, as you would know that uh, by and large people are aware and familiar with what was happening in northern part of India in the uh, early times in the ancient Indian period. But our level of familiarity with what was happening in uh, say fifth century or with uh, say in seventh century AD uh, across the Vindhyas in the Deccan or in the peninsular India is not very clear. And there is a reason for that. And we will discuss uh, as to what could be the reasons for this lack of familiarity, because the uh, the historical sources by themselves uh, are somewhat silent about it. And uh, they 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 refer to this as uh, Kalabra, uh, the period of Kalabra, Kalabra Interregnum. So all these things would be captured in our discussion today. And uh, to begin with, uh, just to give you a sense of what we are trying to do, the scheme of our discussion, what we will do is to first look at the historiography of South Indian history uh, in terms of politics, economy, uh, society, and also ideology or religion. And uh, we would wade through these uh, historiographical trends, talking about the sources uh, used by these historians uh, to weave their narratives uh, in different ways. Uh, they came out with uh, the models of polity, say the feudal model of polity or the bureaucratized centralized model of polity or. We also have Burton Steen's segmentary state theory. So all these things would be discussed in terms of the appropriateness of a particular political model to understand the politics, society and economic changes uh, during uh, this period, during this uh, early medieval period, say from 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries uh, in, in South India. So while you are aware of the uh, political details of, of this period uh, in the peninsular India, you have Rashtrakutas, you have Pallavs, you have Chol, Cher, Pandyas. These are the polities that we would be dealing with, but we would not be bothering ourselves with much of the political details of these. Rather, our discussion would be more analysis centric and we would look at the appropriateness of uh, specific political models uh, suggested by different historians. Uh, to understand as to how the things uh, must have been at around this point of time. So, Mulata Yahi Hamara Vishay Aj Rahega discussion ka, or Ham Rajnatik Jo details hai usko discuss karne ke bajaye jada Ham isbat par dhyan kendrit karenge ki itihaskaro ne alag alag jo models prastut kiye hai apni lekhan me. और जिन जिस प्रकार के स्रोतों का ऐतिहासिक स्रोतों का उपयोग किया गया है और जो भी यहां तो उसके आधार पर जो मॉडल सजेस्ट किया गया है जैसा मैंने आपको बताया कि सामंतवादी मॉडल हो सकता है या अति केंद्रीकृत जो नौकरशाही से परिपूर्ण एक जो राजनीतिक व्यवस्था रही होगी उसकी भी चर्चा कई इतिहासकार करते हैं 
और फिर अंतोगत्वा हम जाकर देखते हैं कि बर्टन स्टीन जैसे इतिहासकार सेगमेंट्री स्टेट की भी चर्चा करते हैं और उसकी क्या विशिष्टताएं हैं और उसके बाद फिर अंत में हम जाकर उसकी एक क्रिटिकल असेसमेंट करेंगे कि अगर उसे हम आलोचनात्मक दृष्टिकोण से देखें तो फिर मोटे तौर पर कौन सी अवस्था कौन सा मॉडल सबसे ज्यादा सबसे ज्यादा आप कह सकते हैं कि एप्रोप्रिएट लगता है सबसे ज्यादा उचित लगता है साउथ इंडियन पॉलिटी के लिए साउथ इंडियन हिस्ट्री के लिए जिस समय की हम बात कर रहे हैं तो अगर सातवीं शताब्दी से लेकर तेरहवीं शताब्दी तक की टाइम को देखें इफ वी लुक एट द टाइम लाइन ऑफ ऑफ से पॉलिटीज इन साउथ इंडिया फ्रॉम सेवेंथ टू थर्टीन सेंचुरी देन वी वुड डिस्कवर दैट द पॉलिटिकल स्पेक्ट्रम इज dotted with several dynasties and these dynasties are like pallavs pandyas cher chol and what we find is that in this period from 7th to 10th 11th 13th centuries there is a gradual expansion of the monarchical form of government jise rajshahi hum kehte hain so there is uh, this trend that we can see from 7th century onwards to uh, to 13th century and the sources that are used by the historians to write history of uh, this period include inscriptions jise aap keh sakte hain shilalekh ya jo kisi durable substance par kuch inscribed hota hai so uh, sources will include inscriptions they also have uh, studied the monuments the archaeological monuments jo bhavan vagaira hain ya kile hain uski bhi uska bhi adhyan kar kar ke itihaskar is samay ke bare mein janna janne ki koshish karte hain then we have literary sources sahityik srot uh, and uh, these literary sources uh, are in tamil language as well as in sanskrit language and uh, so by and large uh, by studying these uh, Uh, th- this range of literary archaeological and monumental sources uh, historians and uh, let's let's remind ourselves that when we say historians we also are including british administrative historians and uh, so from 19th century onwards these historians were studying these monuments these inscriptions these literary sources written in tamil as well as in uh, sanskrit and by and large by the 1930s that is around 90 years from uh, the present times the outlines of south indian history was by and large clear so jo ek roop rekha hota hai uh, itihas ka दक्षिण भारतीय इतिहास का जो अर्ली मेडिवल पीरियड का वो मोटे तौर पर रेखांकित हो चुका था एंड देन इन द नेक्स्ट थर्टी इयर्स फ्रॉम 1930s एंड 1940s व्हाट वी फाइंड इज नो ब्रेक थ्रू और नो ब्रेकिंग ऑफ न्यू ग्राउंड्स एज सच बट द मियर रेपिटेशंस ऑफ व्हाट हैड ऑलरेडी बीन डिस्कवर्ड अबाउट साउथ इंडियन पॉलिटी and there is little bit of rephrasing of that and little bit of quantitative studies uh, from uh, temple sources and so forth and that is what uh, goes on for the next 30 years or so and uh, a big qualitative change in the writing around uh, the south indian history could be seen happening in 1970s 1970 ke dashak mein fir hum dekhte hain ki ek naya paripeksh दक्षिण भारतीय इतिहास के बारे में रखा गया एंड दैट कम्स एट द बिहेस्ट ऑफ सेवरल अमेरिकन एंड जैपनीज स्कॉलर्स हू स्टार्टेड यूजिंग न्यू टूल्स ऑफ एनालिसिस फॉर एग्जांपल यू मस्ट हैव हर्ड द हर्ड द यू यू एक्सटेंसिव यूज ऑफ कंप्यूटेशनल टेक्निक्स uh is something that was new in the 1970s uh, so the terms that were uh, 
inscribed in the inscriptions, the administrative terms or the revenue related terms or the social group terms. So they were all subjected to uh, some kind of a numerical analysis uh, through computational methods. Uh, and uh, Noburu Karashima uh, is the most noted amongst uh, the scholars who did this. And uh, a new perspective emerged. So uh, that is uh, the big picture of uh, the uh, of the of the uh, you can say uh, historiography uh, around South India. Now let's begin from the 19th century as we stated. So before the colonial administrative historians uh, set in to understand and start writing about South India in the 19th century, we basically had uh, several missionaries जो कि धर्म से ईसाई धर्म से जुड़े हुए होते हैं और उनका धर्म प्रचार ही धर्म का प्रसार करना ही मुख्य उद्देश्य होता है तो उस तरह की शक्तियां भी कॉलोनियल इंडिया में ऑपरेट कर रही थी एंड देयर वेर मेनी मिशनरीज हु अटेम्प्टेड टू सर्च द सोर्सेस दे वांटेड टू नो एस टू व्हाट वाज द हिस्ट्री ऑफ साउथ इंडिया एंड सो फोर्थ एंड देयरफॉर टू बिगिन विद इन द 19th सेंचुरी वी ओनली हैड अ वेरी वेग आईडिया of uh, the south indian traditions about uh, dynasties about different social groups about different institutions to dakshin bharti itihas mein kaun si sansthaen thi kis prakar ke samajik varg the kis prakar ki rajnaitik vyavastha thi ye sabhi ke bare mein ek badi dhundli si uh, image uh, hamare samakshh thi kyunki uh, jo bhi uh, iske bare mein jankari hasil kar rahe the wo missionary historians the और 1850 के बाद दैट इज आफ्टर 1850s, वी हैव सम काइंड ऑफ अ क्लैरिटी इमर्जिंग एंड दिस इज ऑल्सो एट द बिहेस्ट ऑफ द एसेंशियली द ब्रिटिश एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव हिस्टोरियंस एंड वी हैव द इपिग्राफिस्ट लाइक जी बिहुलर बी यू एच एल ई आर सिमिलरली वी हैव जे एफ फ्लीट एफ एल डबल ई टी एफ कील K I E L H O R N. Now the, the, these are the names of some uh, British administrative historians who also went on to assume the uh, leadership role in uh, in uh, epigraphy, in archaeology, and so forth. And uh, they are the ones who deciphered, who also edited, who also interpreted, and also published. Uh, a number of uh, stone inscriptions that they found from uh, several places in south india there were uh, offices set up uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for the uh, epigraphy and uh, archaeological studies and copper plate inscriptions were compiled together were co collated at one place and uh, some uh, publications journals uh, started uh, by these people uh, had wide circulation and whatever was found by different scholars from different places of south india got published in those journals and that is how people got to know about as to what is happening or what has been found at some other place in south india and that is how the academic uh, community started interacting with each other and that is how our uh, uh, historical outlines of south india got concretized and it became clear over a period of uh, time so this process began from 1850s onwards and not before for example uh, i would just cite uh, the case of the chola dynasty we we do not know about the imperial cholas i am not talking about the sangam cholas i am talking about the imperial cholas that emerged jo raj raj aur rajendra ke naam se hum log jante hain nauvi 10vi shatabdi ka jo chol empire hai that is what we are talking about so the chola dynasty uh, information Uh, or the information about the imperial cholas essentially came from the copper plate records of the eastern chalukya rulers you know about the uh, two branches of uh, the chalukyas eastern chalukyas and western chalukyas so while going through the uh, epigraphic records of the uh, eastern chalukya dynasty incidentally some information uh, could be had about the cholas and uh, it was uh, uh, corroborated 
by uh, other uh, chronicles also. For example, we have a chronicle by the name of uh, Kongu Desh Raja Kal. Now, Kongu Desh Raja Kal is uh, a particular chronicle related to South Indian polity and details, which uh, talks uh, about the dynastic details of South Indian polities. And uh, on the other hand, we had several uh, inscriptions, some belonging to Eastern Chalukya uh, rulers, and they had incidental reference uh, uh, to the Cholas. And so these dates were matched with the uh, chronicle details. And that is how some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, uh, you can say, chronological sequence of dynasties and rulers could be had for the first time in South Indian history uh, with relation to the rule of the Cholas. So I give you just one example to, uh, to just uh, highlight the process uh, by which different sources were used to uh, weave the narrative, the political narrative of the, uh, of the South Indian polities. Similarly, in 1886, we are still talking of the 19th century developments. In 1886, E. Hulz, H-U-L-T-Z-S-C-H. Now, E. Hulz, who was again a British administrative historian, he was heading the department of epigraphy uh, for the Madras presidency, for the Madras uh, uh, government. And uh, he undertook a thorough combing of uh, the sources in his area. And uh, Hulj was succeeded by V. Venkaya. He was, uh, Venkaya was succeeded by H. Krishna Shastri. So these are the people who are important uh, in terms of heading the Department of Epigraphy and unearthing quite a few sources, editing them, publishing them. And that is how uh, our uh, information, our awareness about South Indian polities with fair degree of exactitude could emerge over a period of time. Similarly, uh, we should also mention the uh, role played by the princely states, uh, say of uh, Travancore, Mysore, Cochin, Hyderabad. So these princely states also joined the efforts of the British administrative historians, uh, the epigraphists who were at work, and whatever was uh, found in, the, in these princely states, they were also brought to the notice of these journals. They were also edited, published in these journals, and different scholars started uh, started uh, commenting on that, started uh, uh, critiquing it, and that is how the uh, academic information about South Indian past uh, was concretized. Now, there is a simultane simultaneous trajectory of uh, uh, research that was going on. Uh, OK, there is uh, one question. Uh, sir, at least samjhao to ki kya padha rahe So what we are doing is मैं हिंदी में बोल इसको थोड़ा रिपीट कर देता हूं जो हिंदी के स्टूडेंट्स हैं उनके लिए हम लोग दक्षिण भारतीय इतिहास प्राचीन भारतीय इतिहास की चर्चा कर रहे हैं जिसका समय है सातवीं शताब्दी से लेकर जिसे अर्ली मेडिवल टाइम्स भी कहा जाता है पूर्व मध्यकालीन युग सातवीं शताब्दी से लेकर दसवीं शताब्दी तक का जो समय है उस समय दक्षिण भारतीय राजनीतिक इतिहास दक्षिण भारतीय आर्थिक इतिहास दक्षिण भारतीय सामाजिक इतिहास दक्षिण भारतीय धार्मिक इतिहास क्या था और इसकी पुनर्रचना कैसे की गई थी इसमें किस प्रकार के स्रोत थे और इसमें किस प्रकार की संस्थाएं बनी उसकी चर्चा कर रहे हैं तो अभी हम लोगों ने जो इतिहास लेखन है जो हिस्ट्री राइटिंग है उस परंपरा की चर्चा की और सोर्सेस की चर्चा की और उसी को हम आगे बढ़ाते जा रहे हैं कि कैसे 19वीं शताब्दी से लेकर आगे के समय तक और उसकी चर्चा हम लोग अभी करेंगे अभी अभी जो भी मैंने बताया है वो आपको 19वीं शताब्दी के संदर्भ में बताया है कि कैसे शुरुआत में मिशनरीज के हाथों और उसके फलस उसके बाद 1850 के बाद जो ब्रिटिश एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव हिस्टोरियंस हैं उसका हमने जिक्र किया कि वो कैसे इपिग्राफी डिपार्टमेंट को हेड कर रहे हैं और कैसे शिलालेख वगैरह जो भी पाए जा रहे हैं उसको पब्लिश किया जा रहा है जर्नल्स फ्लोट किए जा रहे हैं और उससे एक एकेडमिक uh, कम्युनिटी में 
इसकी इसके बारे में जानकारी बढ़ रही है और धीरे धीरे लोग इस समय की राजनीतिक व्यवस्था को समझने में सक्षम होते जा रहे हैं और जैसा मैंने आपको बताया कि इसके अलावा जो प्रिंसली स्टेट्स हैं ट्रेवन कोर की माइसूर की कोचिन की हैदराबाद की उनका भी एक योगदान इसमें है कि वो भी इस एफर्ट को कोऑर्डिनेट कर रहे थे ब्रिटिश एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव हिस्टोरियंस के साथ और ये जो मेन स्ट्रीम है हिस्ट्री राइटिंग का देर इज अमल्टेनियस ट्रेजेक्ट्री ऑफ रिसर्च दैट वॉज गोइंग ऑन एंड दैट वॉज पर्टेनिंग टू द संगम लिटरेचर आपने संगम साहित्य का नाम सुना होगा ना संगम लिटरेचर इज अबाउट दीरियड दैट इज से सेकेंड थर्ड सेंचुरी बी सी टू अराउंड सेकेंड सेंचुरी ए डी एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर पीरियड the details of this particular period is contained in the collection of poems that were compiled say in 4th 5th centuries ad and that is what sangam literature is but the interesting thing with sangam literature is that these ancient polities and we are talking of 7th century ad to 10th century ad and uh, uh, the sangam literature uh, details are about at least uh, say 700 800 years prior to it and uh, incidentally the names of polities in sangam literature happen to be the same that is chol cher pandya satya putras and so forth and since uh, the name of uh, these polities uh, are the uh, are same so to begin with uh, when sangam literature was brought to the notice of historians uh, historians thought that well these details are about the imperial uh, cholas that is the cholas of 9th century and 10th century or the pandyas of 9th and 10th centuries or the uh, cheras of 9th and 10th century that was not so but this was realized later but to begin with this confusion did prevail that uh, whatever was contained in sangam literature initially it was thought that they are all referring to the same subject matter which was being studied through epigraphs uh, by these scholars but uh, of obviously sometimes uh, sometime later it was discovered that uh, well sangam literature is about an earlier period and it details the things uh, which which uh, which is at least separated from the imperial chola period or early medieval south indian polities by around 700 800 900 years uh, or so so uh, that is uh, one thing that i wanted to uh, tell you and uh, uh, then we have another corpus of literature which is equally important and that is the corpus of literature that we know as bhakti sahitya bhakti literature bhakti hymns you must have heard of the bhakti movement that began in south india and uh, the earlier uh, understanding of bhakti movement was that it was a movement uh, which was started by bhakti saints uh, and non brahmanical elements who were opposed to the brahmanical norms and so forth so the uh, the anti brahmanical uh, tinge of uh, bhakti movement was something that was emphasized uh, to begin with but uh, subsequently as we will see that uh, it emerged to be the legitimizing ideology of the polities that were emerging in south india and that we will discuss uh, uh, very soon so uh, this bhakti hymns or bhakti uh, literature contained uh, dates of various saints uh, the shaiv uh, saints as well, as well as the uh, vaishnav saints and uh, it uh, contained philosophical discourses it contained uh, literary appreciation also so this is what uh, uh, is contained in uh, the bhakti uh, hymns and by reading these bhakti hymns by studying these bhakti hymns uh, some kind of an attempt was made to uh, weave this into the mainstream narrative of south india and by 1920s and 1930s as i said earlier as well that the dynastic history of the pandavas pallavas chol that had emerged in a concrete fashion so by 1930s 
uh, we had fairly uh, comfortably got to know as to what is the time timeline of the Pandya rule, Cher rule, Chola rule, uh, or Pallav rule, uh, and so forth. And uh, in this, uh, uh, by the uh, 1940s and 1950s, we have the publication of the monumental work on South India, and uh, that is by K. A. Nilkant Shastri. And his name you must have heard quite a few students uh, who read about uh, ancient Indian history must have read about his uh, his name, Nilkantha Shastri, and he has given a masterly treatment of uh, South Indian uh, history. Uh, and uh, there are several books uh, to his credit. For example, I'll just name a few. Uh, one of the books that he wrote is the Pandyan Kingdom, and this appeared in 1929. Uh, then he wrote about the Cholas that appeared in two volumes uh, and this came in 1932 and 1935. And then finally in 1955 came the magnum opus uh, by Nilkant Shastri and that is the history of South India. Now history of South India is supposed to have standardized the historiographical tradition of early medieval South India. So. Uh, Nirkant Shastri ki jo pustak hai history of South India jo ki 1955 mein uh, prakashit hui uske prakashan ke baad uh, jo uh, hamari jankari hai South Indian polity ki wo bilkul clear ho gai aur ek standard text ke taur par ya ubhra ki agar aapko South Indian history ke baare mein janna hai to Nirkant Shastri ki kitab ko padhiye aur uh, जो नीलकांत शास्त्री हैं उनको उनकी जो इतिहास लेखन की जो परंपरा है जो जो हिस्टोरियोग्राफिकल ट्रेडिशन से वो बिलोंग करते हैं उसे हम रांकियन ट्रेडिशन कहते हैं रांके लियोपोल्ड वॉन रांके आर ए एन के ई ये यूरोपियन थिंकर हैं और जो पॉजिटिविस्ट हिस्ट्री राइटिंग है उसके जनक माने जाते हैं और पॉजिटिविस्ट हिस्ट्री राइटिंग का सीधा मतलब यहां यह है यह आपके जो पॉलिटिकल और इकोनॉमिक सिलेबस है उससे इतर मैं यह बात कर रहा हूं और इसकी जानकारी आपको होनी चाहिए कि इतिहासकारों को 19वीं शताब्दी में यह हिदायत दी जाती थी कि वो अपने समझ से या अपने पूर्वाग्रह से या uh, अपने झुकाव से या आस्था के आधार पर इतिहास न लिखें बल्कि केवल साक्ष्यों के आधार पर लिखें साक्ष्य वैसे साक्ष्य जो कि या तो लिखित हैं या नहीं तो पुरातात्विक तौर पर उपलब्ध हैं जिसे दूसरों को दर्शाया जा सके एविडेंस के तौर पर और अगर एविडेंस नहीं है तो फिर उस क्षेत्र में न घुसे ये हिदायत दी गई थी इतिहासकारों को और अच्छा इतिहास लिखने के ये कि ये आप कह सकते हैं ये एक पात्रता थी कि अगर अच्छा इतिहास लिखना चाहते हैं तो आपको साक्ष्यों को एकत्रित कर कर उसके आधार पर ही लिखना चाहिए और नीलकंठ शास्त्री इसी परंपरा के जनक हैं इसी परंपरा को वो आगे बढ़ाते हैं और अगर आप उनकी पुस्तक पढ़िए history of south india to usme jo historical facts hai, that, that is there is an abundance of uh, historical uh, facts and uh, historical evidence in that literary evidence archaeological evidence terms related to taxation terms related related to social groups bureaucracy state mechanism and so forth uh, revenue terms so uh, that is how this particular book emerged in the 1955 and in the year 1955 and it standardized the uh, the uh, writing tradition about uh, south india uh, and uh, therefore uh, the uh, writing uh, style of k a nilkant shastri is said to be uh, rankian that is he belongs to the rankian tradition of uh, uh, history writing but despite this uh, as all of us know that historians, despite wanting to be as objective as possible, uh, even theoretically cannot be that objective because we are human beings and we operate through our mind. And after all, history is to be written by what we understand 
about past and that is loaded in our mind and the mind is influenced simultaneously by several things that is going around us. And therefore, even in the writings of uh, Nilkantha Shastri, you will discover that uh, the treatment of Raj Raj Chol or there is uh, so there is exalted treatment of Raj Raj Chol. Raj Raj Chol is eulogized. Is is uh, uh, there is uh, his, his account is somewhat exaggerated. Badha chadha kar ek superhero ki tarah inka prastuti karan kiya gaya. Vaise hi you have uh, some kind of a golden age nostalgia about the Cholas uh, that you can see in the writings of K. A. Nilkanta Shastri. All these things, despite bringing out very nicely on the basis of historical evidence, the complex political relations that characterized the polity of South Indian uh, dynasties, the economic scenario that is also very well documented in this book. And we have a lot of details related to taxation, public finance, trade, etc. in the writings of K. A. Nilkanta Shastri. Similar kind of exercise for the Cheras who ruled in the Keral area, the present day Keral area, can be had in the works of Kunjan Pillai. So, what Shastri did to Cholas, the same kind of thing uh, you find being done by Kunjan Pillai. Uh, for the Cheras who were ruling over the Keral area and uh, similar kind of glorification uh, which was typical of the nationalist historians. You understand what is nationalist historians because we are talking about the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. This is also the time when India was struggling for its freedom. Our leaders were engaged in the uh, struggle for uh, independence and therefore they used to write very confident account of India's past, uh, dispelling the notion that India cannot rule themselves or Indians cannot rule themselves. So uh, they were presenting India's past in such a sophisticated way that the entire landmass of the Indian subcontinent or a big landmass of the Indian subcontinent in the past were ruled by one set of uh, dynasty or one uh, set of rulers and there is no need for the British to be here in order to govern us. So we knew uh, as to what it takes to uh, you know, govern ourselves and that was the intent with which nationalist historians were uh, writing about India's past and therefore there is that uh, despite uh, trying to be very objective, despite trying to be very neutral, there is that uh, slant that you can see in the writings of nationalist historians and that is uh, that brings in that element of uh, the glorification of India's past at the behest of nationalist historians. So Nilkan Shastri, Kunjan Pillai, they are not immune from this. So wo isse alag nahi hai aur yah jo uh, rashtravad ka ek put hai, wo unki rachnao mein bhi dekhne ko hame mil jata hai. However, Kunjan Pillai could not quite attain the uh, exalted status that uh, Neil Kant Shastri enjoys uh, with reference to um, treatment of South Indian history because he was very uh, early critiqued by several uh, scholars like FGS Narayanan, Rajan Gurukal, uh, Raghav Barrier, uh, Keshwan Veluthat, and so forth. So they brought out a lot of problems uh, in his account and therefore the kind of uh, the kind of status uh, that uh, K. Nilkan Shastri enjoys with reference to Chol history or South Indian history in general, uh, Kunjan Pillai couldn't quite attain that kind of uh, uh, status. Nevertheless, uh, the first critique of what uh, Nilkan Shastri had written about South Indian history and Nilkan Shastri's uh, uh, attempt was to present uh, the South Indian polities, particularly the Cholas in a very centralized fashion that the king was very strong. He had a vast bureaucracy, army, revenue system under his command. So uh, he presented a very centralized, uh, bureaucratized, tight, tightly controlled kind of, a, uh, kind of an account of uh, the Chola rule. And uh, this particular uh, position of uh, Neil Kanta Shastri was challenged for the first time in the 1960s and by the 1970s, 
you have the writings of Burton Steen, B U R T O N, Burton Steen, S T E I N. And in 1975, Burton Steen came out with a full length critique of uh, K. A. Nilkant Shastri's model of South Indian polities. Um, actually, there is an edited book uh, by the name of Essays on South India. And in that, Burton Steen's chapter is the state and agrarian order in medieval South India, a historiographical critique. So this is the name of the uh, book and the chapter in which uh, Burton Steen critiqued uh, K. A. Nilkant Shastri's model of centralized, bureaucratized uh, empire or state at the behest of the Cholas in South India. So uh, what are the things that he did? Uh, this is what uh, we will we'll, uh, just discuss. Just give me a moment. Just give me a moment. OK. So what are the things he does? Number one, Burton Steen exposes the contradictions in the writings of Nilkantha Shastri. Uh, what are these contradictions? Jo uh, isme visangatiya hai, jo uh, Nilkantha Shastri ki writings ki jo kamiya hai, usko Burton Steen ne expose kiya. Burton Steen ka kehna hai ki Nilkantha Shastri ki jo uh, arthik detailing hai, jo arthik uh, maslo par jo wo baate karte hain. या खेती से जुड़े मसलों की जो वो बातें करते हैं वो मोटे तौर पर सही है सो दी बटन स्टीन सेइंग दैट दी इकोनॉमिक डिटेलिंग एंड दी एग्रेरियन ऑर्डर और एग्रेरियन डिटेलिंग ऑफ नीलकांत शास्त्री इज बाय लार्ज एक्यूरेट बट दिस इज इनकॉन्ग्रुएंट विथ हिज कंसेप्शन ऑफ uh, some kind of a Byzantine kind of a rule with centralized bureaucratized state. He says that ki, uh, facts to sahi hai, lekin uske aadhar par jo Nilkant Shastri ne ek image banaya hai cholo, chola ka, chol uh, prashashan ka, ki wo ati kendri krit tha aur nokar shahi se paripoon tha, uh, raja ke paas uh, revenue ke saare resources the, uski sansthaye thi, सैन्य बल था और वह एक अति केंद्रीयकृत व्यवस्था का राजा था तो यह जो छवि चोल के बारे में नीलकांत शास्त्री ने बनाई है इस छवि को बटन स्टीन ने क्वेश्चन किया सो बटन स्टीन इज क्वेश्चनिंग दिस दिस मॉडलिंग ऑफ नीलकांत शास्त्री ऑफ द चोलास एज एक्सट्रीमली सेंट्रलाइज ब्यूरोक्रेटाइज बाइजेंटाइन किंगडम काइंड ऑफ अ मॉडल्ड uh, polity. Uh, वैसे ही, uh, alongside Burton Steen, we also have uh, George Spencer, S P E N C E R. Now, uh, George Spencer also, uh, to a to an extent, uh, supports what uh, Burton Steen is saying because he is also questioning the authority, the actual uh, economic and political authority with which. The uh, South Indian rulers or the uh, Chol rulers were ruling over South India the way it is presented in uh, Nilkant Shastri's work. So uh, what he uh, says is that, uh, for example, the uh, iconic uh, Chol kings of uh, Chol kings like Raj Raj uh, Chol or Rajendra uh, uh, Chol. So these are the iconic uh, rulers of the Chola uh, Empire. And he says that the Ceylonese expedition, Jo Lanka ke upar, Jo Akraman uh, Cholo ne kiya tha, uh, aur in rajao ke uh, sandar mein wo khas kar baate karte hai, uh, George Spencer. He says that more than being some kind of a military expedition, the stereotypical usual military expedition uh, expedition in the monarchical orders, more than that, it, it perhaps was a politics of plunder. So ye loot, पाठ की लूट पाठ करने के लिए आक्रमण था और लूट पाठ करने की जरूरत इसलिए हो रही थी क्योंकि एक निश्चित ठोस जो राजस्व की व्यवस्था है 
वो संभवतः यहां नहीं थी तो ऐसा जॉर्ज स्पेंसर का कहना है कि एक ठोस आप कह सकते हैं रेवेन्यू सिस्टम के न होने के कारण चोल के राजाओं को हमेशा इस प्रकार के लूटपाट के लिए आक्रमण करना पड़ता था समीपवर्ती इलाकों में और जो श्रीलंका का जो एक्सपेडिशन है जो सिलोनीज एक्सपेडिशन है उसको जॉर्ज स्पेंसर इसी परिपेक्ष में देखते हैं सो जॉर्ज स्पेंसर वांट्स टू सी दिस इन दिस परस्पेक्टिव ओनली एंड देन सिंस नीलकांत शास्त्री हैड Uh, written a great deal about the wonderful temples that uh, the south indian kings uh, were sponsoring or were getting built these uh, elaborate stone temples and so forth uh, and uh, nilkan shastri presented them uh, uh, as uh, as symptomatic of uh, the might and power and the financial muscle of uh, the uh, south indian rulers now spencer and burtonstein are challenging this for example spencer says that these uh, uh, these uh, temple buildings actually are uh, a system maintaining mechanism so uh, it's not as if uh, they have huge resources and that's why they are generous people generous rulers and therefore they are giving endowments for constructing such magnificent temples rather spencer says that for them it it is an absolute uh, necessity to build these uh, temples as uh, symbolic of their rule and uh, it is by building these temples that they at least appeared to the public that well they are the ones who are under control otherwise on the actual historical plane if you look at the revenue system if you look at the policing if you look at the army if you look at the several other real tangible sovereign powers levers of power or officials perhaps spencer says that that was absent and in the absence of that uh, there was uh, this recourse uh, of temple building that these rulers had to take and so this is how he uh, goes on uh, saying uh, that it was a sim- it was a system uh, maintaining mechanism of a weakly organized polity so uh, spencer says that actually the polity of south india or the cholas was weak and in order to appear formidable in order to appear to the public as kings they had to Uh, uh visibly be seen uh, making these temples or spe- sponsoring these temples and that is how he puts things in perspective to ye baat to mujhe lagta hai aap logo ko ab clear ho gaya hoga ki kaise jo charitra hai jo nature hai south indian polity ka usko itihaskaron ne kaise alag alag tarike se dekha hai abhi jo main uh, दो लोगों के बीच कंट्रास्ट कर रहा हूं इसके पहले उन्नीसवीं शताब्दी में मैंने आपको बताया कि कैसे अलग अलग स्रोतों को का उपयोग कर कर पहले मिशनरीज उसके बाद ब्रिटिश एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव हिस्टोरियंस और उसके पश्चात जो नेशनलिस्ट हिस्टोरियंस हैं उसी का बाय प्रोडक्ट आप नीलकंठ शास्त्री के तौर पर देख सकते हैं और उन लोगों ने किस प्रकार से दक्षिण भारतीय अर्ली मेडिवल इतिहास को प्रस्तुत किया उसमें इम्पेरिसिज्म या पॉजिटिविज्म का पुट तो है ही ऑब्जेक्टिव हिस्ट्री तो है ही हिस्टोरिकल uh, फैक्ट्स से परिपूर्ण है लेकिन उसके साथ साथ कहीं ना कहीं राष्ट्रीयता का पुट भी है और इसके कारण देर इज लिटिल बिट ऑफ एग्जैजरेशन देर इज एक्सटॉल दीज द पावर एंड प्रेस्टीज ऑफ दीज पॉलिटीज आर सम वॉट एग्जैजरेटेड बिकॉज इट वॉज रिटर्न अंडर द इंफ्लुएंस ऑफ द नेशनलिस्ट फेज ऑफ हिस्ट्री राइटिंग so uh, that is what we said and then we have moved to the uh, scenario in the 1960s and 1970s we have the writings of burton stein we have the writings of george spencer who for the first time are elaborately questioning the model with which nilkanth shastri had sought to understand south indian polity so uh, what burton stein now says that after critiquing uh nilkanth shastri who was uh, who had almost uh, who was uh, who was the uh, big figure so far as uh, south indian uh, history writing is concerned so after critiquing him he says that so uh, 
what was what must have been the model what must have been the scenario so in order to highlight that he says uh, steen says that uh, the political evidence that we get to have from medieval south india or early medieval south india would not fit into any alternative framework be it monarchical or feudal to is samay tak दो ही मुख्य रूप से जो मॉडल थे राजनीतिक व्यवस्था के वो इस समय प्रचलित थे एक तो अति केंद्रीकृत राज व्यवस्था जो कि मोनार्किकल सिस्टम जिसे हम कहते हैं राजशाही कहते हैं जिसमें एक राजा होता है उसके अधीन सारे पावर होते हैं उसकी सेना होती है उसका राजस्व व्यवस्था होता है उसकी टैक्सेशन सिस्टम होती है उसके टैक्स ऑफिशियल्स होते हैं तो यह एक शक्तिशाली राजा के तौर पर जो अति केंद्रीकृत ब्यूरोक्रेटाइज एम्पायर की एक इमेज है वो थी वहीं दूसरी तरफ फ्यूडल इमेज जिसे हम कहते हैं हिंदी में आप कह सकते हैं कि सामंतवादी व्यवस्था माफ कर एक मिनट यस तो अगर सामंती व्यवस्था के मॉडल को देखें तो उसकी भी आलोचना कर रहे हैं बर्टन स्टीन एंड ही सेज दैट इवन द फ्यूटल मॉडल वुड नॉट फिट इन टू द काइंड ऑफ डिटेल्स दैट वी गेट फॉर साउथ इंडिया एंड आई होप दैट स्टूडेंट्स नो अबाउट द फ्यूडल मॉडल जो सामंतवादी व्यवस्था है उसके बारे में मुझे लगता है कि स्टूडेंट्स को जानकारी है मैं मोटे तौर पर आपको यह बता दूं कि जो अति केंद्रीकृत राज व्यवस्था राजशाही या सेंट्रलाइज्ड सिस्टम जिसके बारे में अभी तक हम लोग चर्चा कर रहे हैं और जिसकी बात नीलकांत शास्त्री भी करते हैं एज अपोज टू दैट वी हैव पॉलिटीज दैट आर फैशन अराउंड द फ्यूडल सिस्टम फ्यूडल वॉट इज अ फ्यूडल सर सामंतवादी व्यवस्था क्या है सामंतवादी व्यवस्था का मतलब है कि जो भी सत्ता है राजनीतिक आर्थिक सामाजिक जो सत्ता है वो किसी एक केंद्र या पद में अवस्थित नहीं होता है सो दावर द पोलिटिकल इकोनॉमिक और सोशल पावर डज नॉट रेस्ट इन वन पोजिशन और वन अथॉरिटी एंड दैट इज ऑफ अ किंग सो दिस इज वॉट फ्यूडल मॉडल सेज फ्यूडल मॉडल सेज दैट the power or the sovereignty is somewhat parcelized parcelized with alag alag uh, uh, jo sansthaye hain ya alag alag log hain usme wo antar nahi hota hai aur kisi ek vishesh vyakti ya pad mein wo sari satta antar nahi to nahi hoti hai to aisa mana jata hai ki kai samant hote hain chote chote ilakon ke upar unka varchasva hota hai और वो किसी भी तरीके से और ध्यान रखें कि ये जो रेवेन्यू सिस्टम है टैक्सेशन सिस्टम है फ्यूडल सिस्टम में दे आर एक्स्ट्रा इकोनॉमिक कोअर्जन तो ऐसा नहीं है कि आप कुछ करते हैं या सिंचाई करवाते हैं या कुछ और तरीके से उसमें इन्वेस्ट करते हैं और इसलिए आप टैक्स लेते हैं बल्कि दे आर एक्स्ट्रा इकोनॉमिक इन नेचर यानी कि आप केवल राजनीतिक रूप से उस इलाके के दबंग हैं और इसलिए आपको कुछ टैक्स के तौर पर मिल जाता है और ऐसे ही सामंतवादी व्यवस्था चलता है सो दी रेवेन्यू मॉडलिंग इज नॉट ऑलवेज इकोनॉमिक बट एट टाइम्स इट इज एक्स्ट्रा इकोनॉमिक कंसर्न गिव मी जस्ट वन मिनट राइट ओके इन द मेन टाइम इफ the students are having any doubt or problems they can uh, go on uh, uh, typing their uh, problems uh, i can see it on the live question and answer uh, board and in case they have any doubt initially uh, i could see couple of them i did try to address them uh, in whatever we discussed so far so in case you have any doubt you can go on typing it and be mindful of that because i can see it right in front of my screen तो कोई भी डाउट अगर स्टूडेंट्स को है बीच में तो वो लिखते जाएं ताकि मैं उसका निवारण यहां से जहां तक कर पाऊंगा वो करता जाऊंगा ओके सो दैट इज द फ्यूडल मॉडल एंड इन फ्यूडल मॉडल 
there are several other attributes also. I'm not getting into the deal. For, for example, feudal model is essentially resting on an agricultural system. So there is minimal trade, uh, commerce, or urban activities, and so forth. So these are several other attributes of feudalism that we get to see. Uh, right. So uh, what Bertenstein is saying that uh, even the feudal model uh, would not fit into the kind of uh, uh, historical material and facts and details that we get to see, that we get to have from the uh, Chola period or uh, from other South Indian polities, be it uh, uh, Pallavs, be it Chalukyas, be it Rastkutas and so forth. And therefore, in 1977 and later in 1980, uh, he comes out with uh, the segmentary state in South Indian polity. And this segmentary state model is that he proposes to, uh, as a model to understand and comprehend as to what South Indian polity and economy and society in the early medieval times must have been. Now let's try and understand as to what he means by uh, this and we shall talk about it uh, in a little bit of detail uh, uh, subsequently. And uh, he proposes, Bertenstein proposes this model of segmentary state for South Indian polities right from 7th century AD down to 16th century AD. Vijayanagar kingdom tak Jo Dakshin Bharatiya Rajnatik Vyavastha thi, usko samajhne ke liye Burton Steen ne segmentary state model ka prayog kiya. Aur uh, jab, when, when in the 1980s when it initially came, this model came, it was celebrated in the histo historical circles as a great piece of work uh, which had uh, done away with uh, the uh, centralized modeling or feudal modeling of South Indian polities and it was a new thing. So it was there was a lot of buzz around this particular kind of presentation by uh, Bertenstein. But very soon uh, even this model was critiqued by uh, scholars and historians who were uh, who were very empirical in their approach. Empirical means they are fact bound. They, so we will see as to what their critique is. But uh, to begin with, uh, in the 1980s, with the emergence of the segmentary state model, the conventional way of portraying South Indian history in distinct heads of polity, economy, society, religion, that fashion had faded. So, this was the paramparik tarika tha, uh, Dakshin Bharti Itihas ko prasut karne ka ki Dakshin Bharti e samaj ek chapter mein, Dakshin Bharti e arth vivastha, Dakshin Bharti e rajniti, Dakshin Bharti e dharm, इसके ऊपर अलग-अलग चैप्टराइजेशन करकर जो पुस्तकें लिखी जाती थी, वो परिपाटी खत्म हो गई और अब थोड़ा सा हर एक चीज को एक दूसरे से मिलाकर समन्वित तरीके से उसके अप्रस्तुति करने की एक नई परंपरा का नीव सेगमेंटेड स्टेट मॉडल के प्रोपोनेंट्स ने रखा और इसके बाद हम पाते हैं जैसा कि मैंने आपको बताया कि uh, even this segmentary state model was critiqued greatly uh, by uh, several historians and uh, they essentially are empiricist historians. That is, they rely more on facts, on evidence, on tangible things and not on fluid arguments. Right. So uh, we will see that segmentary state was critiqued of being very uh, wooly and very uh, not rooted in the reality of the period, not rooted in the reality of the time. Uh, and it was more uh, based as some kind of a narrative, deliberate apne ek vivastha ko uh, bana diya apne, uh, apne dimag ke uh, bal se aur apne ek kahani gar di aur uh, उसके जो साक्ष्य होने चाहिए जिसके आधार पर आपने वो कहानी गड़ी है वो संभवतः उतने आ, उतनी संख्या में है नहीं तो इस प्रकार का क्रिटिक आना शुरू हो गया आ, 1980 के आ, दशक से एंड द हिस्टोरियंस हु कंट्रीब्यूटेड टू क्रिटिकिंग द सेगमेंटरी मॉडल ऑफ बर्टनस्टीन इंक्लूड 
आर चंपक लक्ष्मी आपने नाम सुना होगा डीएन झा का नाम सुना होगा आपने नोबुरु काराशिमा जिसका उल्लेख मैंने किया कि ही वॉज द वन हु जैपनीज स्कॉलर हु ग्रेटली रिलाइड ऑन कंप्यूटेशनल मेथड्स टू आर्ग्यू हिज पॉइंट्स सिमिलरली सुब्रयालु विजय रामा स्वामी सो दीज आर सम ऑफ द हिस्टोरियंस हु फ्रॉम द नाइनटीन एटीज ऑनवर्ड्स स्टार्टेड क्रिटिकिंग the hypothesis of burton steen uh, burton steen's uh, segmentary state model for south india and uh, it was uh, revealed uh, at the behest of these uh, historians that burton steen's concept of segmentary state uh, was basically modeled on aidan south halls uh, alur society of uh, east africa सो एदन साउथ हॉल जिन्होंने पूर्वी अफ्रीका के आलूर जनजातियों के ऊपर अध्ययन किया था और उनकी व्यवस्था उनकी राजनीतिक व्यवस्था को समझने के लिए जो साउथ हॉल ने जो मॉडल यूज किया था सेगमेंट्री स्टेट का उस सेगमेंट्री स्टेट मॉडल को उसी प्रकार से बर्टन स्टीन दक्षिण भारतीय Early medieval times को समझने के लिए प्रयोग कर रहे हैं सो दिस इज हाउ इट वॉज रिवील एंड वॉट डज इट इंटेल सो वॉट डज इट मीन आई मीन वेन वी सेगमेंट्री स्टेट मॉडल सो वॉट आर दी एट्रीब्यूट ऑफ सेगमेंट्री स्टेट मॉडल एंड लेट्स ट्राई एंड अंडरस्टैंड दैट आई कैन स्टिल नॉट सी स्टूडेंट स्टार्टिंग क्वेश्चन इन केस यू आर विथ मी यू कैन कॉन्टिन्यू Uh, typing uh, something or uh, i'll just go on presuming that you all are getting what i am trying to put across now this segmentary state model assumes a world of peasants without the landlords this is uh, this is uh, strange because uh, in the feudal model you have the peasants jo ki खेत पर काम करता है एंड ओवर दैट ओवर द प्रेजेंट्री देयर इज द क्लास ऑफ फ्यूडल लॉर्ड्स हु आर द मास्टर्स एंड द पेजेंट्स गिव सम बिट ऑफ टैक्स टू द फ्यूडल लॉर्ड्स एंड द फ्यूडल लॉर्ड्स रिटेन अ शेयर ऑफ दैट टैक्स विथ दम सेल्स एंड ओकेजनली through some means or the other not through very well defined uh, revenue system uh, on annual basis but occasionally on some occasions specific occasions and festivals they would part with one portion of that collected tax to the feudal lord over him who was the suzerain who was the ruler who was the king so in feudal system uh, king is nothing but the biggest feudal lord in the area so <clears throat> if there are 10 uh, feudal lords the biggest feudal lord would be the one who would be uh, getting little bit of uh, uh, these gifts and so forth occasionally by the smaller feudal lords and he would be regarded as the suzerain of uh, that area so this is how uh, uh, feudal model presented uh, the south indian scenario to begin with and uh, segmentary state model is questioning this so what uh, uh, segmentary state uh, model says is that instead of this arrangement where there is a vertical uh, hierarchy of peasants over that you have feudal lords over the feudal lords you have the suzerain and so forth instead of this what you had in uh, or what uh, the uh, segmentary state model proposed is that you had uh, the uh, the the society or economy was uh, uh, organized on the basis of ethnically cohesive and uh, specially compressed units that is chote chote jaghon par kuch samuh logon ka rehta tha jo ki ethnic roop se ek the और जो जिस ज्योग्राफी पर जिस भूगोल पर वो रहते थे वो भी सीमित था वो बहुत कोई बड़े क्षेत्र पर नहीं रहते थे तो ऐसे ऐसे 
पॉकेट्स थे ऐसे ऐसे छोटे छोटे समुदायों में लोग रह रहे थे अलग अलग लोकेशन पर और जो समुदाय था वो एक दूसरे से इथनिकली जुड़ा हुआ था और ईच ऑफ सच यूनिट अलग अलग ये जो समुदाय है वो अपने आप में पूरे राजनीतिक व्यवस्था का एक सेगमेंट होता था अगर आप सर्किल ये दिस इज वर्ड फ्रॉम ज्योमेट्री अगर आप सर्कल को देखें तो एक सेगमेंट इज वन पार्ट ऑफ इट वन वन केक ऑफ इट वन पोर्शन ऑफ इट तो इनका कहना था कि उसी तरह से कई सेगमेंट्स थे कई कम्युनिटीज कई कंक्लेव्स लोगों के प्रेजेंट्स के एक इलाके में थे और ये सभी सेगमेंट्स जो हैं वो मूलतः स्वायत्त थे दे वेर ऑटोनोमस दे वेर ऑटोनोमस इन द सेंस दैट द सुजरेन द रूलर इंजॉयड अ वेरी वीक कंट्रोल ओवर दैम सो द रूलर कुड नॉट एक्सरसाइज वेरी एफेक्टिव कंट्रोल Uh, on them, so that that is something that we get to see, and uh, this uh, segment of the political system uh, wielded actually political powers and was subject only to the ritual sovereignty of the ruler. So, Mulata jo sakta hai, wo in segments ke haath mein thi, na ki raja ke haath mein, aur ye segments apne decisions khud lete the. और एक केवल आंशिक रूप से और जिसे हम कहते हैं कि रिचुअल सॉवरिटी केवल रिचुअल तरीके से वो एक बड़े राजा के अंदर थे वो उसके अंतर्गत थे राजनीतिक रूप से और वो जो कंट्रोल था दैट इज ओनली रिचुअली वैलिड नॉट एक्चुअली जैसे हम लोग अभी भी भगवान के बारे में यही कहते हैं कि भगवान के आगे सब झुक जाते हैं और ऐसा मानते हैं कि सत्ता भगवान की है और उसके आगे किसी की नहीं चलती और ये वो लेकिन जब करना होता है तो हम लोग किसी के सुनते नहीं हैं और खुद की करते हैं तो ये हुआ कि भाई कोई रुकावट नहीं है कोई उस तरह का दबाव नहीं है और सेगमेंट्स जो है वो अपनी डिसीजंस खुद ले रही है किसी के दबाव में नहीं ले रही है और एक केवल रिचुअल तरीके से जो सॉवरिनिटी है वो रियल तरीके में एक्सरसाइज ना होकर वो रिचुअल तरीके से मात्र एक्सरसाइज हो रही है तो ऐसा नहीं है कि वो डायरेक्ट टैक्स ले रहा है या उसकी फॉर्मिडेबल आर्मी है या उसके प्यूनिटिव मेजर्स हैं या उसकी न्याय व्यवस्था है या उसके क्वानिस सिस्टम है जो कि सभी जगह व्याप्त है एंड दैट इज हाउ दी सॉवरिनिटी ऑफ द रूलर इज एक्सरसाइज सो Uh, segmented state says that uh, nothing of this sort is happening rather uh, all the power is vested in these segments uh, which are uh, uh, which are uh, ethnically cohesive and they are living in different geographies of this area and they are subject to only the ritual sovereignty of the monarch and therefore this uh, kind of rule is to be understood in a way that is different from the centralized model of state polity or the feudal model of state polity and that is why it says that it should be understood as the segmentary model of state polity and therefore when uh, these detailing is done what uh, buttonstein is actually arguing that, that you can uh, note as points number 1 as per the segmented state uh, uh, notion of uh, polity there is no specialized bureaucracy or the prime center to so, ek koi uh, jo jise hum kehte hain naukar shahi jo raj vyavastha ka ek parichayak hota hai to naukar shahi sambhavta is raj vyavastha mein nahi tha segmented state mein naukar shahi nahi hota Uh, और कोई एक प्राइम सेंटर नहीं होता जैसे अगर आप मगध या मौर्यो के रूल की बात करें तो मौर्यो के रूल में व्हाट वाज़ द प्राइम सेंटर मगध वाज़ द प्राइम सेंटर सिमिलरली इफ यू लुक एट द रूल ऑफ द गुप्तास इट इज द मगध एरिया और द ईस्टर्न यूपी एरिया व्हिच बिकम्स द न्यूक्लियर एरिया ऑफ कमांड एंड अदर एरिया आर ब्रॉट अंडर इट्स कंट्रोल सो that kind of uh, hierarchy or that kind of some areas being prime areas and some areas being peripheral areas that is not something that is the characteristic feature of segmented state segmented state says that there is virtual absence of effective bureaucracy and 
um, there is nothing like prime center because all segments are equally important and equally important. They are equally important because they are uh, autonomous. They 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 uh, carry out with their business on their own and only on certain occasions for ritual purpose they are seen as under one particular ruler or empire. Similarly. There is no monopoly of coercive power in segmentary state model. Of course, what is coercive power? Coercive power is the power to get something done by the threat of uh, police or military intervention, by the threat of uh, military force or punitive force. Uh, so even if people don't want to pay tax, they have to pay tax because if they don't pay tax, then the police would be sent or the army would be sent or the officials would be sent or some punitive action would be taken against uh, that person. So that is how it generally operates, be it the centralized model or the feudal model. But what uh, Bertenstein is saying on the segmentary state model is that there is no monopoly of coercive power under segmentary state model vesting with the king. So Raja पद के अंतर्गत इस तरह का कोई विशेषाधिकार राजा पद में अंतर्निहित नहीं होता है कि वह एकमात्र संस्था ऐसी होती है जो कि लोगों को दंड दे सके जो प्यूनिटिव मेजर्स ले सके क्योंकि प्यूनिटिव मेजर्स लेने की जो सत्ता है वो एक जगह अवस्थित नहीं होती है राजा के पद में so this is what segmented uh, state model is trying to say that the monopoly jo ek adhikar hai the monopoly of coercive action is not there with one particular institution or with the institution of the king rather it is distributed all across and therefore uh, it has to be understood as something different from the centralized state or the feudal state similarly it also says that there is no central mechanism of revenue assessment. Now, revenue is uh, very central to any uh, command and control uh, pol political model. For example, if, even if you look at the case of the Mauryas, we all look at Cortilla's Arthashast and say that, well, look, uh, it was a centralized empire because there were so many officials. These officials are named in uh, uh, Cortilla's Arthashast. Some of these officials are named even in Ashokan inscription. Some of these officials are named even in uh, Megasthenes' Indica. Then uh, even the salary of these officials is mentioned in uh, Cortilla's Arthashastra and uh, the uh, number of horses, the army, the cavalry that the state maintained, that is also mentioned in uh, very specific terms in the uh, Mauryan sources and therefore the dominant image that goes is that the king had control over the area because he had so much of taxation power uh, and it is believed that uh, Mauryans taxed uh, the subjects a uh, little bit more than the conventional one-sixth uh, of, of uh, the total produce, Shadabhag, as per the uh, scriptural tradition in India that is what the state should uh, appropriate uh, in the name of uh, revenue, the one sixth portion of the produce, but probably Mauryans uh, siphoned off uh, a portion which was bigger than one sixth uh, of the total produce. And that goes on to establish that they had a lot of resources uh, under their command because the taxation system was very tight and effective during the Mauryan period. And so what segmentary state model says that there is absolutely no central mechanism of revenue assessment and collection. Uh, and uh, basically it is the these segments themselves who devised some ways or means by which they could collect a little bit of uh, say communal fund or corporate fund and a part of it could have been uh, given to the uh, king on some specific occasions and that was also not very specified. So there is no uh, very elaborate mechanism or revenue apparatus that is uh, at play uh, in, in uh, this period. So this is by and large, these are some of the attributes of the segmented state model and uh, 
as I said that uh, by the 1980s, uh, historians, several historians, and I named them Champak Lakshmi, Rajan Gurukal, Keshwan Veluthar, D. N. Jha, and so forth. They started questioning uh, this uh, model of segmentary state. They started critiquing it. So wh what are the points of criticism of the segmentary state model? Number one, uh, these historians said that, uh, well, uh, the theoretical underpinning of segmentary state model is very weak. In fact, it is invalid. So, jo ek, uh, theory uh, ki jo hoti hai, jo theory ki jo, uh, requirements hoti hai, uh, segmentary state model mein is prakar ki jo requirements wo apne apne puri nahi hoti hai ya ek uh, uh, apurn uh, theoretical model hai uh, pehli baat jo uh, iske virodh mein ki ja rahi hai wo ya hai then these historians also charged the proponents of uh, segmentary state model of misrepresentation of data unka ye kehna tha ki jo sakshi ye prastut kar rahe hain wo सही आलोक में प्रस्तुत नहीं किए जा रहे हैं जो भी उदाहरण या जो भी प्रमाण दिया जा रहा है the evidence that uh, the supporters of segmentary state model are citing they are not valid uh, uh, evidence and in fact it it should be understood in a way that is different from what the uh, supporters of segmented state model have sought to understand. And uh, then uh, they go on to say that this modeling, segmented state modeling relies more on speculation, more on guesswork, and therefore it is a kind of fictional model. model वो उसके आधार बड़े ठोस हैं इसलिए ऐसा कहा गया है तो एक तरह से जो सेगमेंटरी मॉडल स्टेट सेगमेंटरी स्टेट मॉडल के जो विरोध में जो इतिहासकार लिख रहे हैं वो इसकी क्रिटिसिज्म कर रहे हैं और अगर आप सपोर्ट ग्रुप देखें दोस हु आर इन फेवर ऑफ सेगमेंटरी स्टेट मॉडल एट अराउंड दिस टाइम इन द 1980स एंड सो फॉर सो अपार्ट फ्रॉम ऑफ कोर्स बर्टन स्टीन you have George W. Spencer and uh, George W. Spencer ka maine pehle bhi jikr kiya uh, is uh, uh, lecture mein uh, aap se. And what does he say? He says that uh, there is a vast religious network uh, and royal influence by which the state power is exercised by the kings under segmentary state model. So uh, Spencer keh rahe hai ki uh, इस सेगमेंटरी स्टेट मॉडल में जो राजा है उसे वो प्यूनिटिव मेजर लेने के कारण राजा नहीं है या उसकी सत्ता इसलिए नहीं है कि वो उसके अंतर्गत एक बड़ी आर्मी है या उसके अंतर्गत एक बहुत बड़ा इलेबोरेट रेवेन्यू सिस्टम है या टैक्सेशन सिस्टम है बल्कि वह सत्ता में इसलिए है क्योंकि वह अपने सत्ता का प्रयोग एक दूसरे तरीके से कर रहा है और वह है धार्मिक नेटवर्क बनाकर या जो रॉयल्टी रौ, है उसका इन्फ्लुएंस अलग अलग जगहों पर दिखाकर और इसी संदर्भ में जो मंदिर बनाना सिस्टम मेंटेनेंस जिसकी चर्चा मैंने पहले की मंदिर अलग अलग जगहों पर राजाओं के द्वारा बनाना चोल राजाओं के द्वारा चेर राजाओं के द्वारा पल्लव राजाओं के द्वारा बनाना बनाने की जो परंपरा है उसको स्पेंसर इसी आलोक में देखते हैं कि वो उनकी एक तरह से कह सकते हैं कि उनकी एक कंपल्शन है क्योंकि उसके पास वह सत्ता नहीं है जो कि एक अति केंद्रित व्यवस्था में राजा के अंतर्गत होता है उसके पास रेवेन्यू के मैकेनिज्म नहीं है उसके पास प्यूनिटिव मेजर्स उतने नहीं है उसके उतने ऑफिशियल्स नहीं है तो फिर वो अपनी सत्ता को कैसे दर्शाएगा वो अपनी सत्ता को लोगों के सामने कैसे प्रस्तुत करेगा तो इसको दर्शाने के लिए उसे मंदिर बनाना पड़ता था उसे अलग अलग जगहों पर uh, कुछ अनुष्ठान करने होते थे धार्मिक रूप से एक नेटवर्क उसे बनाना पड़ता था और वहां वो भ्रमण कर कर यहां या कुछ एक्टिविटी कर कर वह लोगों के बीच यह दर्शाता था एक तरह से लेजिटिमेसी पाता था वैधता पाता था uh, शासन को uh, आगे बढ़ाने के लिए सो दैट इज व्हाट जॉर्ज स्पेंसर इज ट्राइंग टू से एंड देयरफॉर ही सेज दैट एसेंशियली इन फाइनेंशियल टर्म्स इन रिसोर्स टर्म्स 
the segmented states are very weak states. They don't have enough uh, uh, economic power to bring about major transformations and so forth. And therefore, in the absence of a very regular taxation system uh, that uh, could be enforced, they had to resort to the politics of plunder. So occasionally they had to uh, carry out invasions in the neighboring areas to resort to loot and plunder in order to get a little bit of material by the help of which they could sustain their rule. And therefore, it's a completely different kind of modeling that uh, they are doing. And uh, therefore, uh, in other words, you can say that uh, what Spencer is trying to say or what uh, Buttonstein is trying to say is hinting towards statelessness. राजव्यवस्था जैसी कोई एक कंक्रीट चीज है ही नहीं सेगमेंटिव स्टेट मॉडल में और यदा कदा ओकेजनल इस तरह से अपने आप को जो व्यवस्था है वो अपने आप को लोगों के समक्ष प्रस्तुत करता है एंड देर इज एब्सोल्युटली नथिंग बियॉन्ड इट सिमिलरली इन सपोर्ट ऑफ बर्टनस्टीन अपार्ट फ्रॉम जॉर्ज डब्ल्यू स्पेंसर यू हैव सेवरल अदर हिस्टोरियंस लाइक केनेथ आर हॉल H A W L L Kenneth R Hall, uh, Nicholas B Dirks, D I R K E S, Richard Kennedy K E W N E D Y. So these are some of the uh, scholars who support uh, the segmented state model of uh, uh, Burton Steen. I named uh, them Spencer, uh, Hall, Dirks, Kennedy, and so forth. Whereas the opponents. those who started critiquing uh, the segmented state model and i told you uh, their viewpoints that included noburu karashima that included y subarayalu that included r champak lakshmi who has written extensively on urbanization and so forth that uh, included d n jha who has extensively worked on temple economies the way they were operating in south india then uh, that also included rajan gurukar who has written a lot about agrarian system and the state under the pandyas so these are two different sects of scholars who side with the segmented state model and those who oppose the segmented state model uh, alongside that you also have ngs narayanan and keshavan veluthar who uh, uh, oppose uh, the segmented state model ngs narayanan has Uh, written about uh, bhakti as an ideology of of temple centered uh, society and we will uh, we will just talk about it if the time permits so uh, that is how it is now little bit of elaboration about the sources uh, uh, again i am looking at the uh, question answer uh, column and i don't see much activity over here Uh, i would appreciate if uh, i'm able to get through you can pose questions so that i can uh, take it straight away uh right so uh, in terms of sources which i did allude to uh, towards the beginning uh, unlike north indian copper plate charters the south indian copper plate charters and you know about copper plate charters copper plate charters are uh, Uh, issued by the donors to the donees as land assignment so wo ek you can say these are uh, property right documents uh, and uh, they are called copper charters because they were in the form of copper plates uh, and uh, that have been discovered with uh, quite a few details inscribed on it name of the donor name of the donee and specifications of the land or area that has been donated and what are the rights and privileges of the uh, donee and what are the rights still retained by the donor and so forth so quite unlike the north indian copper plate charters the south indian copper plate charters clarify both elements that is alienation of state power plus its operational part in north indian copper plate charters only alienation part is uh, generally described that okay now that this land has been given to you so from here on the donor or the original owner of the land who has donated will not do these things will not send royal troops will not tax you will not uh, do this will not interfere into this 
So these are the things that are mentioned in the North Indian copper plate charters. Whereas in South Indian copper plate charters, these things are mentioned uh, from the donor point of view. Uh, that is alienation power of the uh, alienation part of the state power that the state will not do all these things in this donated piece of land. But it also uh, writes about the operational part. Okay, what will happen in these areas? So uh, what actually the donee is likely to do that is also mentioned uh, in these copper plate charters of South India. And it is on this operational part, on the basis of this operational part, that the historians, these historians who I just named as uh, opposed to segmented state model, they say that when you look at the operational part of these uh, details, uh, you get to, or, or there, uh, there is some semblance of feudalism that can be seen here, or some idea of a pyramidical structure uh, is very much visible. Pyramidical structure means there is one person with superior right and beneath him there are several other persons who don't have that much of superior rights, although they have their own rights. And then beneath them, then th there is another bigger set of uh, or bigger set of people who have a different set of powers, but not as high as the ones above them. So there is this hierarchy and it is pyramidical. That is, it is, uh, it is top light, bottom heavy kind of uh, structure. Uh, thousands of stone uh, uh, inscriptions are issued and uh, they record transactions of either Brahmade uh, assemblies or similar such bodies like Ur, Nagaram, Nadus, these are some of the terms that you can read about. Uh, these are important terms and in, uh, in order to detail them, you should be knowing about it. So uh, you have uh, inscriptions that are copper plate uh, grants. Some of them uh, appear in the form of Sanskrit Prashasti, whereas there are uh, quite a few others uh, which are written in uh, Tamil language and uh, they are uh, they uh, outline the objectives of the grant. Ki ye grant diya ja raha hai, land grant diya ja raha hai. So they are very, if you look at the language of it, they are very terse and business like that. OK, this is what uh, will happen. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. So there is not much of, uh, you know, lyrical or some poetic uh, thing weaved around it. It is very transactional business like document that you get to see, particularly in the Tamil uh, version. Uh, then there are stone inscriptions. Uh, most of these stone inscriptions are written in Tamil and Malayalam, and uh, they record the transactions of various temple committees uh, or several other local groups uh, about land and other properties. And uh, there are several social aspects to it. For example, the landowners. Uh, represented or landowners depicted uh, in these inscriptions are not only Brahmins, but also non Brahmins. They are also merchants. They are notables in several other capacities as well. Uh, however, all social details or aspects are not exhausted by these detailing in these inscriptions. So there are several aspects of society that uh, went unrepresented so far as these detailing in these inscriptions are concerned. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, several Chol uh, stone inscriptions uh, have been subjected to very rigorous uh, computational uh, analysis in order to get whatever social uh, inference that we can from uh, these sources. And uh, Karashima, Subraya, Luke, Shan Mugam, these are some of the historians who have uh, done these computational uh, analysis. Similarly, over and beyond these epigraphic sources in the copper plate charters and stone inscriptions, we also have literary sources. Some of them are temple centered, some of them are court literature. So, temple centered is most of the bhakti hymns when these bhakti saints moved around, they would engrave, they would get something engraved on the walls of the specific temples um, in, in which they stayed or around which they stayed. So some bit of information is contained there as part of the temple inscriptions. And then there is uh, uh, court literature also. Th those who were part of the royal uh, uh, 
uh, court and the court poets, you can say. So they have also penned something, although uh, much work has not been carried out by historians on the court literature. Then there are architectural monuments, as I told you in the beginning of the lecture, that they also serve as important uh, entry point uh, in terms of sources to understand South Indian politics and economy. Uh, and uh, for example, the social function of uh, these architectural details, there, is, uh, there are uh, prakara, there are hierarchical patterns, there is one sanctum sanctum in the temple, there is uh, encirclement of uh, uh, that sanctum sanctorum by circumambulatory passages in which uh, you have several bhakti literature inscribed around it. So they, uh, this architectural modeling is also uh, done with uh, some kind of an imagery and they might be symptomatic of some kind of a social order. And that social order probably is uh, that of feudalism because uh, it it uh, it reminds us of the uh, of the finer sensibilities of feudal thinking that okay there is a prime deity and around that there are minor deities and around that you have several uh, people who are devotees of a particular deity but they also understand that uh, this particular deity has an over arc is under an over arc of another bigger deity so there is that hierarchical hierarchical patterning that is visible in the domain of religion uh, and temple building also. So architecture also reveals a lot about the social sensibilities and imagination and the social pattern in which the society was organized. So uh, that is what it is. And uh, if you look at the process of uh, uh, economic differentiation as to how over a period of time a particular area got differentiated, how agriculture moved, the economic uh, dimension of it, then you find that uh, in the Sangam literature, that is uh, 3rd century BC to 2nd century AD period, uh, you have qualities like uh, Chol, Che, Repandya, Satya Putras and so forth. They are tribal confederacies and uh, uh, they don't have uh, very organized uh, uh, agricultural system as such, but uh, their area is uh, is uh, divided into several tinais, T-I-N-A-I, -I, tinai, and tinai is ecological patch, eco-zones. So uh, some tinai is uh, predominantly, uh, say, uh, coastal area, uh, some tinai is predominantly woodland, some tinai is uh, predominantly mountainous area, some tinai is predominantly very arid and uh, uh, desert-like area. Some Tinai is uh, quite green and capable of uh, uh, sustaining a lot of vegetation that is referred to as Marutam. And over a period of time, we find that Marutam becomes the uh, charmed area for all the uh, uh, tribal chieftainships of Chol, Cher, Pandir and so forth in, in, the, in the Sangha period itself. And uh, that uh, over a period of time reveals the importance of uh, agriculture and the way agriculture was uh, gaining inroads into the economic fabric of uh, South India. So, uh, and then uh, there are several works uh, by Champak Lakshmi and so forth who have, uh, uh, who, who have, who has looked at several institutions where communal gatherings happened almost the way it happened in Sabha, Samiti, Rajasuya Yagya or Ashwamedh Yagya in North India. So that kind of gathering where some bit of redistribution of resources happened, asymmetric redistribution means people who bring gifts, they are uh, given return gifts, all right, but uh, not all of them get it equally and uh, some people uh, end up getting more, some people end up retaining more of the resources and that is how asymmetric uh, redistribution happens on these occasions. Uh, and then uh, the role of the chiefs, the role of the bards, that is wandering minstrels, etc., who provided uh, this bit of legitimacy to these rulers by singing bards in the praise of these kings and so forth. Uh, this is all on the lines of Vedic sacrifices that uh, gave legitimacy to rulers in North India. So uh, the, uh, the 
human counterpart of that uh, in South India becomes these uh, wandering uh, minstrels, uh, these uh, bards and so forth. So uh, there are works on the Vedic, Shastric and Puranic elements uh, in Tam Tamil Sangam literature and uh, how Marutam as an ecological region uh, got uh, or emerged as the most favored uh, over a period of time and the transformatory role that it played in the uh, economic history of uh, uh, the area or in the social political formation of uh, South India uh, and so forth. So uh, these things, of course, are not very clear uh, in the absence of these sources, but uh, definitely they played a catalytic role. Uh, they played a role of a catalyst in transforming. Similarly, inter-regional trade exchange, the Indo-Roman uh, uh, trade that was going on in the post-modern period and so forth. So basically, it is the peninsular India that was gaining out of it. It did not have a developed market. It did not have a coin and currency system uh, to the extent that it could leverage this to you know, leapfrog into a different kind of social formation altogether. But certainly, the balance of trade being in favor of India, there be, this area was a net recipient of uh, gold and silver coins, and there are several Roman artifacts distributed over different zones in this area that archaeology has brought to fore. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, the Roman gold and silver that is coming to this area is not being used as coin because there is no developed market system here, but people are using it as bullion. Bullion is, uh, you can say, the customary or ornamental usage of these coins. So they are not putting it into investment, but certainly they, they did constitute some form of wealth for, for the people around. And over a period of time, it could have led to uh, economic uh, distanciation of one group that had more uh, such wealth under their control and uh, some other groups uh, that probably did not have that much of wealth under their control. So. Uh, this interregional uh, trade exchange and overseas trade uh, and exchange that is happening, that also become, became an additional factor apart from intensification of agriculture in the emergence of these polities uh, in the case of South India. Then uh, the chiefs uh, of Sangam age who uh, controlled maximum number of Marutam, they over a period of time exercised uh, significant control over other areas and we talk of uh, these uh, literary sources talk of the three kings that is Muvendar. Muvendar is the three crowned kings, the Cheras of Vengi area, the Pandyas who were dominant in Madurai areas and the Cholas who were dominant in Urayur areas. Similarly, uh, they had the twin capital system. So uh, uh, one capital would be inland and the other capital would be uh, a coastal area and that tells you about the importance of uh, uh, importance of overseas trade because all these polities they are not very developed uh, state systems they are tribal oligarchy they are tribal chieftainships and yet they do understand the importance of having at least one capital on the sea coast so that some bit of leveraging of the profit uh, of the profitable Indo-Roman trade could be done by uh, their incipient polities. So you have uh, the Musiri uh, port under the control of the Cheras, the Korkai uh, area is under the control of Pandyas, which served as the uh, coastal capital, and the Cholas had uh, the coastal capital at Pukar. So third to seventh century AD is the period if you see because up to third century AD we uh, do find uh, uh, evidence from Sangam literature and the Indo-Roman artifacts uh, in the form of archaeological evidence and so forth. But the third to seventh century AD is referred to uh, in the sources as Kalabra or the period of uh, historical long historical night. And uh, immediately after that, so there is some bit of disturbance, there is some bit of subversion or whatever. We don't have uh, much information about this period, but certainly that continuum uh, is missing. And certainly from around 7th century AD, we find the emergence of the Pallavs. Now, this emergence of the Pallavs in the backdrop of the Kalabra or having ended the Kalabra, the uh, Pallavs emerged. 
and therefore there is some kind of a disjunctive character of the pallavas although uh, some of the recent writings have questioned this disjunct disjunctive character uh, of the pallavas but uh, certainly uh, it it appears that uh, there could be some element of disjunction in the emergence of uh, the pallavas because the uh, emergence of pallavas is associated with a new ideology it is associated with a new social formation and uh, it is all subsequent to this period that we find that the process triggered at the beginning of the emergence of the pallavas is something that over a period of time intensifies uh, and give uh, gives rise to several uh, monarchical polities which have been studied under feudalism or under segmentary state the way we did all through this lecture so what happens is that there are a few epigraphical records uh, uh, which uh, of course is one sided perspective it gives you the ruling class perspective but uh, it does point to the opening of a large uh, agricultural settlements uh, or large agrarian tracts uh, or uh, river valleys uh, of the pennar and palar rivers that were opened by the efforts of the pallav ruling class so intensive agriculture was perhaps not ever carried out in these uh, agrarian uh, potentially agrarian zones and it was only at the behest of the pallav ruling class that this uh, agrarian tract was opened colonized and intensive agriculture could begin in these areas and uh, over a period of time a large number of non -cult non cultivating managerial class emerged that we know as intermediaries they had nothing to do with uh, uh, cultivation as such they are not producing class but they are helping the system to work they are collecting something they are facilitating something they are uh, giving some kind of security and order to the area and that is how they earn their livelihood and that is why they are referred to as intermediaries who are operating between the owner and the actual tiller of the land but that is very much symptomatic of the feudal order the large number of intermediaries so over a period of time ever since the emergence of the pallavas we have emergence of these intermediaries class having superior rights and inferior rights some of these intermediaries are having superior rights over land some of these are having not so superior rights over land but they are all exercising their rights over the same piece of land and that is uh, something that uh, reminds us of the zamindari system of 18 19th century also so that kind of intermediary uh, intermediaries are emerging uh, in the uh, in the wake of uh, the emergence of the pallavas and the subsequent times uh these records also talk of the creation of maintenance of a large number of uh, brahmin uh, corporations uh, in settled as well as non settled areas that is uh, barren pieces of land uh, and uh, these uh, uh, brahmanic settlements uh, were uh, perhaps instituted uh, by subjugation or also by some cooperation so uh, some set of persons who were given land grants or who were asked to move over a, a particular area so when they went there either they subjugated uh, the natives uh, in this area and uh, established themselves in superior position or they struck some kind of give and take kind of uh, deal and uh, some kind of a brahmin peasant alliance was forged uh, between them and uh, that is how uh, over a period of time uh, we find brahminical settlement uh, increasing uh, in this particular period uh, in in uh, south india and uh, uh, what what the brahmins brought to the table uh, so far as the economic transformation of this area is concerned is that these brahmins coming as they were from the north uh, they were uh, far better uh, equipped with organizational abilities or capacities they had for uh, they had more advanced agricultural calendar and they were more aware of agricultural operations and technology and therefore in the uh, in the uh, possession of this agrarian know how they could uh, organize they could reorganize the economic order of these areas and that is how agriculture could gain roots Uh, or could gain uh, inroads uh, into these areas where earlier there was no intensive agriculture so uh, you have uh, brahmins subjugating uh, 
the local people model and you also have the Brahmin Peasant Alliance. For example, subjugation, subjugation model is something that is proposed by Dirkan Shastri, D and Jha and so forth. They, they say that when Brahmins went, they wanted to subjugate uh, local people and that is how they uh, they organized or reorganized the socio-political scenario of the area, whereas uh, Burtonstein says that uh, it doesn't happen that way. Brahmins came into some kind of a give and take uh, relation with the local people and the peasants, and that is how they uh, sustained themselves um, as uh, not very much superiors, but as partners in, in this transformation. So uh, that is that is how it went. And uh, we find repetition of similar processes uh, happening elsewhere in the areas under the Pandyas. Uh, uh, so uh, I talked about the, uh, the Pallavs. Similarly, the Pandyas were uh, active in the area of Vaigai and Tamarparni Basin. And we have evidence of several irrigation works done by the Pandyas. Uh, Rajan Grupal has uh, uh, written a great deal about this. And there is a definite role of the Brahmins uh, in being the harbinger of uh, agrarian change in uh, uh, these areas, Vaigai, Tamraparni Basin under the Pandyas. And the minor chiefs uh, 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 were subjugated by these uh, Brahmins and were brought under uh, the overall monarchical control through cattle raids. And we have hero worship, stone uh, 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 memorials, etc., which uh, which, which testifies to this uh, skirmishes through which the Brahmins uh, uh, made inroads into these areas. And uh, overall, all these uh, changes led to some kind of an integration and social formation. Uh, and and uh, this, uh, this gave a tremendous boost to the intensification of the rich Kaveri Valley uh, in the area around Tanjavur and uh, Tiruchapalti uh, districts. Uh, and this uh, enabled this particular region uh, around Tanjavur and Tiruchapalli uh, to, uh, 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 to create a much stronger base, uh, economic base or economic resource in terms of agricultural surplus for the state elaborate system to emerge um, compared to the Pallavs and the Pandyas. So that accounts for the uh, for the uh, you know resources, economic resources that could sustain a very elaborate uh, monarchical uh, order, very elaborate monarchical system that we get to see in the form of the uh, Cholas. Similarly, in Kerala, uh, we find similar developments, uh, spread of Parshuram cult. Uh, Parshuram tradition, which is again symptomatic of uh, the Brahmanic uh, 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 entry and ingression into this area. And uh, uh, all through the Konkan and uh, Canaries coast, we have Ponani, Periyar and Pampa rivers, uh, which had uh, got colonized uh, during this period of time by the agriculture society uh, by the 19th century AD. And then we have extent of uh, uh, royal initiative uh, in establishing such settlements. Uh, or then uh, we have uh, the uh, Chera kingdom on the western coast after the sack of the Chera capital Karur by the Pandyas. Such ingressions are uh, further made and uh, new settlements are created. So what you find is that uh, these internecine war that these smaller polities are engaged in also has to do with their attempt to have control over agri agriculturally fertile areas and that tells you about that takes you to the very familiar terrain of uh, uh, historical transformation where uh, these wars are being fought uh, not for other regions, but to exercise control over resource rich area. And this resource rich area is nothing but areas of vast agrarian potential. And that is something which is uh, important uh, from our point of view. And uh, this is uh, uh, something that gave uh, political expression to the new social formation, which is uh, the Brahminic upper class uh, emerging as the rulers. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, uh, scholars like uh, M. J. Narayanan and Keshwan Veluthart have studied with reference to the Nambudris and so, so forth. 
Similarly, uh, in the domain of religion or ideology, bhakti, as I said towards the beginning of the uh, lecture, that uh, initially it was uh, understood as anti brahmanical social movement of protest. But over a period of time, now the uh, mainstream understanding of bhakti movement is not that radical, but as a legitimizing uh, uh, ideology, as a legitimizing, uh, as a uh, legitimizing idea of this very uh, transformation uh, that uh, this area is undergoing. So bhakti movement seen as some kind of an ideology of legitimation for the contemporary development in economy, society and politics of the period between 7th to 10th century AD in South India. At the economic level, it, uh, it uh, uh, legitimized the uh, graded hierarchy of economic relations with various shades of rights in land, which is uh, very symptomatic of any agrarian society or which is uh, part of the feudal order as we understand it because uh, there are several intermediaries and the rights are graded and it is not a vertical kind of command control kind of a thing. Similarly, in at, at social level, there uh, this uh, bhakti ideology ended up uh, legitimizing graded hierarchy of social relations with various shades of ritual status. So ritually also people were organized differently and that is uh, uh, what we understand as caste system. So this ideology also spread in this area and uh, the social ritual uh, status uh, is not uniform across this uh, classification of caste system. So uh, that is something which also got uh, legitimized by Bhakti movement. And then politically, uh, uh, the graded rights of political relations uh, with different shades of power and authority. So some, some political powers are bigger, some political powers are not so big, some political powers are very small, but they all had uh, got its legitimacy from the Bhakti ideology because Bhakti ideology is about that because it will talk about the gods and gods themselves are arranged in such a way that one god is chief god, the other god is uh, is powerful all right, but under the um, uh, suzerainship of the bigger uh, god and then there are smaller gods who are there, but uh, uh, their power and might cannot be compared to the uh, to the uh, to the all powerful God at the top and so forth. So this kind of the religious architecture at the thought process level that Bhakti uh, Bhakti ideology is dealing with is in some way also legitimizing the transformed economic, political and social scenario of uh, of the period uh, that we are dealing with. That is 7th to 10th, 11th centuries AD. So uh, the ruling class ended up identifying themselves with this uh, spread of Bhakti ideology, the uh, devotion to Shiv and uh, Vaishnava deities uh, are not abstract, uh, but they are consecrated in temples and the temples are built uh, as a replica of the royal household. So how does a temple look like? What is the architectural uh, design of a temple? It, it tries to replicate uh, the way uh, royal households were. So there is the place where the chief deity sits and then there is a lower place or a smaller place around which the ministers or some other official sit. Then there is again a vertically uh, uh, lower place where the common people would uh, stand and so forth. And all that uh, is is uh, exemplified in the architecture of temples also. So it, it's like saying that well, uh, uh, we generally say that it is God who made man, but fact of the matter is that it is man who made God. So we, we style our God uh, in, in, uh, in a fashion that we are accustomed to. So how do we, uh, how do we, uh, uh, design our temples is uh, on the designs of the royal household. So that is the argument that these historians give in order to uh, in order to understand uh, the functionality of bhakti ideology as a legitimizing force for the transformations that were brought at the economic, social, political level in this period that is from 7th century to 10th, 11th century.
So this by and large uh, takes care of uh, what I had intended to do with you with you just quickly because uh, we still have a little bit of time. I think five minutes and in case there is any question you can uh, post it. I'll be most willing to answer. So uh, there is also the system of uh, 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 large number of uh, non Brahminical peasant settlements. Uh, individual landholders, old locality chiefs um, alongside the dominance of Brahmins that is emerging in this area. And uh, by the 9th century AD, Bhakti had brought under its uh, uh, vortex, we can say, uh, the emerging feudal structure of the society and the Pallavs, Pandyas, Cheras and Cholas uh, that represented different denominations of the uh, monarchy. They are different dynastic affiliations of the monarchical system that was in operation from uh, uh, at around 9th and 10th centuries AD. You find that this is, this is very typical of uh, feudal order that uh, you have uh, all these polities uh, forging alliance with each other while at the same time some are uh, uh, fighting with the other and the uh, one uh, dynasty which is fighting with the other dynasty is also trying to forge some uh, alliance with some third dynasty in the vicinity and so forth. For example, if you uh, take the example of the Rastakutas, Cholas, and Cheras, what we get to see here is that there is the basic fight between the Rastakutas and, uh, and the Cholas. So that is the basic fight between the two, but uh, the Cholas and the Cheras are cousins. Whereas the Cheras are sending force to supplement, to strengthen the Rastkutas and the Rastkutas are fighting the Cholas. So uh, that, that uh, explains the web of relationship, political relationship, matrimonial relationship, social relationships that get forged during the feudal times and that is something which is very symptomatic of uh, feudal order. That is something which is very symptomatic of feudal culture and therefore the proponents of uh, feudal model uh, talk about these things uh, as the attributes of the period. So to just sum up what we have done today is we began with uh, the uh, sources and historiography uh, of uh, 7th to 10th century, 11th century period for South India. Uh, we talked about the missionaries, we talked about the British administrative historians, we talked about the uh, um, epigraphy departments, we talked about the journals, we talked about the nationalist historians, we talked about the critique of the nationalist historians at the behest of segmentary state model, and we talked about the critique of the segmentary state model uh, at the behest of the proponents of feudal model. So that takes care of the entire range of uh, historiography around this particular time, around this particular theme of political, social, economic and religious transformation of South India in the early medieval times. Now, in through this historiography, we entered into the transforming details, economic, political, social and uh, uh, religious. So we spoke of Kalabras, we spoke of uh, the disjunctive uh, uh, role of the Pallavs in uh, creating a new social order, in creating a new kind of ideology. And then uh, we went on to look at the uh, processes of uh, uh, colonization in uh, critical uh, river valleys of different uh, zones by different polities, be it the Cheras, be it the Pallavas, be it the Pandyas, be it the Cholas. And uh, as a result of this uh, intensive uh, agriculture being undertaken in these areas, uh, capacity uh, of these areas to produce surplus uh, got increased and these resources went on to uh, uh, make it possible for state apparatus to emerge and sustain for themselves. And that is how uh, feudal polities emerged over uh, these areas uh, in the form of uh, Chol, Chir, uh, uh, Pandyas, uh, Rashtrakutas uh, and so forth uh, and, uh, and uh, Pallavs. 
and uh, the way different historians through their perspectives have sought to understand or make sense of the nature of polities that is something that we did Nilkantha Shastri looks at them from centralized bureaucratized model uh, Buttonstein uh, and Spencer looks at them from the uh, segmentary state model with ritual uh, sovereignty and uh, not much of real power exercised by them and then there are uh, historians uh, like Champa Lakshmi, uh, Rajan Gurukal, D. N. Jha, and so forth, who have emphasized the feudal character of these polities. So, by and large, if you have a question on this, you have to talk about all these uh, models of uh, statecraft, of all these models of polity, uh, uh, in order to uh, in order to uh, exercise a grip over the transformations that were happening uh, at the economic, political, social and religious levels in the early medieval part uh, of uh, South Indian history from say 7th to uh, 10th, 11th century AD. So in case there is any question, uh, I don't see uh, any uh, listed here. So that is it uh, for the day and I thank you.